And let me just uh, open up with a, with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just uh, invite you into our presence here tonight, Lord, and give you praise and give you glory for uh, saving us and for giving us your love, your forgiveness, and meaning and purpose in life. And we just ask you to open our hearts and minds to your truth, Lord, and just guide and direct us through this uh, information, Lord, and uh, highlight the, the truths. If there are things that are, that are said, things that I misinterpret and misstate and uh, lead wrongly, please uh, correct that in my mind and, and those that, that hear this information, Lord, because we want to be set free, and only free is going to come from the true truth. So uh, reveal that truth to us as we look into the way you've uh, created the universe and created us and the way you work through us with your faith and with your spirit and uh, with your son, Jesus. We just uh, uh, ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to just start by reading our kind of our sentinel scripture out of the uh, Amplified tonight. Um, now to him who by in consequence of the action of his power that is at work within us, is able to carry out his purpose and do super abundantly, far over and above all that we dare ask or think, infinitely beyond our highest prayers, desires, thoughts, hopes, or dreams. And that's the, the, uh, the source of that power from within that, that is working within that we're... Uh, uh, trying to come to an understanding of so that we can maximize that potential that we all have. And I, as, as our uh, thesis goes, uh, I, we, we all have this tremendous potential within uh, with uh, the faith of Christ himself in us, and we, I, I think, you far underutilize that. So we're in the process of uh, trying to understand that. And uh, before uh, uh, the 20th verse that I just read, I just want to jump back up to verse 18 and read that uh, because it talks about the, the, uh, the dimensionality. And uh, when we have Christ, when we have the Holy Spirit activated within us, uh, we have a, a different dimension of understanding. Uh, and verse 18 says, That you may have the power and be strong to apprehend and grasp with all the saints, God's devoted people, the experience of that love that is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth of it. So there, there are four dimensions there. And I specifically uh, highlight that because uh, uh, one of uh, Albert Einstein's great uh, uh, obstacles to understanding God was that he, he admittedly stated that he couldn't uh, understand this, uh, this uh, fourth dimension. And you have to have the Holy Spirit activated in your life in order to understand the, the fourth dimension. So uh, as we were talking uh, last week, we were talking about the, uh, the flow of information and energy. And uh, I made the statement that uh, the whole universe is made up of information and energy. And the purpose of what we're doing here from start to finish is to follow the flow of information. And I talked about with my uh, faith board over there and that the... the, the uh, the spirit is, you can look at it as an actual organ in the body that contains faith. And that, uh, that spiritual organ that we all have uh, releases that faith. And that there are obstacles and impediments to the release of that faith. And God has given us far more uh, abilities to, to uh, enjoy and to accomplish through the release of that faith if we know his plan for the release of it. And uh, I was thinking of this... Uh, the, the other night I was thinking, you know, if, if we were um, uh, invaded by Martians and uh, the Martians uh, looked at us as human beings not knowing or understanding anything about us because they're from, a, they're from a different planet, so they're wondering how in the world do we take care of these human beings? And uh, that's dear to my heart because I've spent most of my childhood taking care of uh, sick cats and sick dogs and birds and every other kind of animal you can imagine. I would try to nurse them back to life again. Uh, so I was thinking of, of, of this Martian looking at us as humans. How is it that we, we can best take care of these organisms because they're, they're, they're our new pets. We don't, we don't want to lose them. And uh, I was thinking that simple, that simple little uh, metaphor uh, example would be that uh, they should uh, uh, subscribe to and uh, begin to apply uh, biblical principles to the caring of, of humanity. 
That, that's the best way I know of to take care of human beings. And it's exactly uh, the, the position that I took a, as a family doctor for the 35 years that I have endeavored to take care of humanity was uh, to, use, uh, to use the Bible and to use uh, God's uh, way so that we could uh, activate this, this potential we have. I've just put some summar summaries on, on the board here to, uh, to begin with. And, uh, you know, when God created the universe, he created the universe. Oh, first of all, I want to point out something. Last week, uh, I, was, uh, I always have my tongue in my cheek when I'm uh, talking about uh, creation and using the biblical model versus the scientific model because my, uh, my own uh, academic background, uh, being a zoologist, is like, uh, actually like majoring in, in evolution. So that, that rings in my ear pretty prominently. Um, and when I was talking about the fact that uh, the spirit injected information into the water, and then the water became energized by light, that implies that the water on our planet is older than the sun because it existed there before the sun was created by God. And that is exactly contrary to uh, every scientific uh, measurement that, that's ever been done. Uh, science states that uh, the sun is the source of hydrogen. And of course, hydrogen being the uh, main component of, of uh, water, uh, they've uh, done all kinds of sophisticated uh, dating methods, and they've, they've come up and concluded that the hydrogen on planet Earth is, is uh, not as old as the sun. So the sun came before the water did. And that's not what the Bible says. Well, I don't know if any of you are aware of this, but CNN just had a report this last week. I had a, a, a good buddy of mine that came running through the parking lot this morning and said, hey, did you hear about the scientific uh, evidence that now shows that the hydrogen on planet Earth, the, in other words, the hydrogen making up water on planet Earth has now been proven to be older than the hydrogen uh, making up the sun. So it totally confirms uh, our, our thesis here that uh, the, the Bible gives us the, uh, the right uh, dating and the right uh, sequence of events in creation. So when God created the universe, he created it through his word and through his, uh, through his actual faith, through his thought process. The mind of God created uh, the, the whole universe. And as we saw last time, he did that by injecting uh, information and information through, the, through his spirit, through his mind, hoovering over the water, and the water was the carrier of that information. But when you look at the, just the physical principle of, of what God used to create life, he used his word, which is sound, and sound vibrations, uh, as you know, is a, physical, is a physical force, a physical energy, and he created, the second part of his creation was, was through his mind, through his uh, thought. He, uh, he thought before he uh, created. And uh, I'm just going to turn to, to Jeremiah, because this, uh, this backs up. Uh, I've made this statement a couple times, uh, but I haven't, I haven't read the, the corresponding uh, verse to that. And that is that I've said uh, repeatedly that we as human beings existed long before our physical conception by the combining of our mother and father's DNA that we existed before that. And in Jeremiah 1.5 it says, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou comest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. And I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. So there, there's that, that, uh, that one verse, there, there are three or four other verses that, that imply the exact same thing, state the same thing, and that is that we were created in the mind of God before our actual physical creation. So we, we uh, were injected our very existence. That information was injected into the creation of the universe at the, uh, at the, time, of the, at the time of the creation of the universe. So in, in God's uh, 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 mechanism, he has uh, created this uh, uh, thing that we call the universe and created our lives through his word and through uh, his thought, through his mind. And it, it, as I said, the word it represents a physical uh, force in the universe, which is sound, sound waves. That's why we're all hearing where our eardrums are getting hit with sound waves. So that causes a vibratory frequency that our ears pick up. Our thought 
is broken down, as we saw last time, when, when, the, when the light came on through the sun, the sun energized the water. It caused a polarity of the water molecule. It caused an, an actual shifting of the water, creating an actual fourth phase of water that has been now uh, recognized by science. And that fourth phase of water causes the flow of electrons from one po point which is negative to another point which is positive. And that flow of the electrons is the actual energy that creates motion. And we saw water that was electrified last time. We saw it actually pulsating. It was nothing but water and energy in it. And it was literally pulsating, just like the pulse beat of a heart, the pulse beat of our lungs. So that, that, electro, that e electromagnetic energy is what, is what God uh, uses as his vehicle. Again, th that, that isn't, God isn't, isn't an electromagnetic God, but he uses the electromagnetic power and frequencies uh, to, uh, to manifest himself through us. Um, and uh, so, so that's where we, we stopped off uh, last time. And uh, I, I did mention that, that we as, we as uh, humans we have the capability, we are made in God's image, so he has given us the capability to actually have the same kind of effect on the universe that he had on the universe. Uh, we, we can speak, we, we can uh, emit a word into the universe, and uh, uh, scientific studies show that our thoughts and our emotions uh, also have an effect on uh, the universe through their effect on uh, electrons, which are the, the substance of atoms. And that uh, the Stark effect of being one is the, is the fact that uh, the human brain, the human mind, the human heart can literally have a, uh, an effect on the flow of the electrons. It can change the molecular structure of atoms. Likewise, our emotions, more, more so our heart, which has a magnetic uh, force to it, uh, actually causes a change in the spin of the electrons in atoms. So we literally have an effect on the atomic structure of the universe uh, through what we think uh, and, and what we feel. And that's uh, similar to the, to the mind of God. Once it becomes uh, regenerated and once it becomes uh, matched back up uh, with, the, with the will and with the frequency and with the resonance of God, and that, that's what we're trying to do is, is come to that point. And as I've said, in order to come to that point, we have to get rid of some old held uh, ideas, some old held beliefs, and the most prominent belief is that of, of determinism. And as I've said, uh, we all in this room here are affected by determinism, whether, whether we want to admit it or not, because it's the world system. It's the way we've all been educated. It's the, it's the foundation of the world that we are all determined. And if you look at the way uh, science and, and uh, theology actually began to look at the universe, uh, you know, we began to look at the universe to understand it by, by looking at the solar system. And we were looking, we're looking at the solar system, and, and uh, as we've stated, the mathematical principles that govern the solar system are fixed. That uh, Saturn, or Earth, is uh, going to be easy to calculate where those planets are going to be six hours from now, or six days, or six weeks, or six months, because this is a fixed universe. Well, if the universe is so fixed and, and operates on mathematical principles, and this was, this was the position that Albert Einstein took, uh, was that uh, why, would the, why would there be a need for God? If everything is already determined, why would there be a need for God? And just to give you an example, uh, when I was in medical school, my uh, textbook of biochemistry was called Biochemical Predeterminism. And it was, uh, it was uh, written uh, and edited by uh, a guy by the name of Dean Kenyon, who has since become uh, a uh, creationist. <laughs> he, he has, uh, he has uh, changed his tune. But what, what, uh, what Dean Kenyon's uh, idea was, and, and that continues to pervade most of science and most of uh, uh, molecular biology, and that is that, that uh, this structure, this, these, are, these are just two rungs in the ladder of DNA, uh, just to show as a, as a molecular model. But what that whole theory says is that this molecular model is determined by the forces that occur just around these molecules. There's nothing from the outside that has any effect on this. This forms it by itself. So that, that is tantamount to saying, uh, 
if you take a handful of uh, steel and you just throw the steel down on the floor, that out of that steel you're going to spontaneously get something that's meaningful, something that has purpose, and something that has information and energy in it. And that is what I mean when I say determinism. And that theory con continues to pervade our world and, to a great extent, our, our hearts and our minds. We, 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 without even thinking about it, uh, we assume that things are determined in our lives and in our universe. And when you take that attitude that things are already determined, well then what's the sense in living life? What's the sense in trying to make a change? If, if we live in a deterministic world um, then, uh, and everything is, everything is already determined uh, and we are excluded from that, well then we become victims and we uh, don't have the capability to make any changes in our lives. And that seemed to me to be a very unfair system. Uh, that seemed to me to be very unfair. It was one of the things that led me to, be, to, to look for the uh, solution for this as I was going through my own uh, educational process and my own search is that, well, you know, if, if, there's any, if there's any real true depth and meaning and purpose behind this whole universe, why would somebody make this universe so that we were uh, the high, most highly sophisticated living organisms on planet Earth and, and we don't have any choice in uh, what our destiny is. And that's basically what determinism says, is you don't have a choice. You're determined by the molecular structure of your DNA, and DNA is all put together, all on its own. It's just the way the nuclear forces and the weak forces, the strong forces, the magnetic forces, the electric forces all come together, and that's what you get when you throw a bunch of molecules together. Well, as I showed last week on, the, on that magnetic board I had, uh, there somebody had to organize all of this. And that somebody that had to organize this has been recognized in, in physics a lot longer than it has in biology. It's still not recognized in biology. And of course, I'm, I'm a biologist. But uh, just to give you an example of, of, of what I mean by that, I want to read some, read some quotes to you. Uh, here's Albert, one of Albert Einstein's uh, uh, famous quotes that uh, is very, extremely meaningful. He says, the sole governing agency of the particle is the field. Now, to Albert Einstein, the field is this vacant space out here, this spiritual world that we've been talking about. And he says that the sole governing agency of the particle, which is us, its mass, its, its, its molecules, and it's everything in our physical world, this is all determined by things in this empty space out here. Uh, so Albert Einstein knew that there was a grand design, there was, there was a mind out here somewhere that was controlling everything. He didn't understand it and, and didn't uh, come to the understanding that we have the fortune of coming to today because there wasn't that, that uh, uh, volume of information available to him. Let me just read another uh, quote from uh, Max Planck, who is the uh, uh, physicist who is the father of... of uh, of uh, modern physics and the, the father of quantum mechanics, which is the study of the physics of this spiritual world. He says, all matter originates and exists by virtue of a force. We must assume behind this force the existence of a conscious and intelligent mind. So he recognized that there was a conscious, intelligent mind. This whole thing, this whole thing of us, us in particular, we don't just come into existence without a reason, without a purpose, without a guiding hand, without intelligence, without all of these factors, we just don't come into existence. It, it's it's, it's uh, impossible. And he saw that, uh, you know, 80, 80 years ago, long, longer I saw it, that's for sure. Um, and he called this mind, he called it the matrix. It's the matrix of all matter. It's, it's, what, it's what creates all of, uh, all of the matter that, uh, that occurs. Uh, he also made this... Made this uh, 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 significant uh, quote. He made this uh, shortly after he won the Nobel Prize in Physics, by the way. He says, as a physicist, that is a man who has devoted his whole life to a uh, holy, uh, honorable science of physics, the exploration of matter, no one would surely suspect me uh, of being a theologian. And so, having studied the atom, I am telling you that there is no matter as such. All matter arises and persists only due to a force that causes the atomic particles to vibrate, holding them together in the tiniest of solar systems, the atom. Yet in the whole of the universe, there is no force that is either intelligence or eternal. And we must therefore assume that behind this force, there is a 
conscious, intelligent mind or spirit. So he is telling us that behind this whole massive universe, there has to be a conscious mind and a conscious spirit. I mean, that sounds like he's describing God to me. This is the very origin of all matter, is what Max Planck uh, concluded. I, wonder, I, I thought I had the quote uh, that Albert Einstein had made. He, uh, he made a quote, uh, he, couldn't, he couldn't grasp the, the, the fact that, that, uh, that everything wasn't determined by a mathematical equation. And one of his comments was, was that uh, uh, he didn't think uh, that, that the universe was made by a god that would, uh, that would play dice. And he was, he was talking about the, the randomness of, of life the way it is. And if there wasn't some randomness to life, then we as humans wouldn't have an impact on it. So there has to be that built into the universe. This is another quote from Einstein. I see a pattern, but my imagination cannot picture the maker of that pattern. I see a clock, but I cannot envision the clockmaker. The human mind is unable to conceive, listen, of the four dimensions. And he was absolutely right. The human mind is not capable of seeing the four dimensions. Uh, he's conceding that. So how can I conceive of a God before whom a thousand years and a thousand dimensions are as one? Uh, Albert, Albert Einstein. So uh, I, I read those just, just to, to, to show you that uh, this whole uh, knowledge and information about our universe and, and the, the very structure of our universe has been seen by certain elements of, of science uh, 80 to 100 years ago, and we're just be beginning to catch up to that, uh, most of us who, who don't have the phenomenal vision and mind that some of these, some of these guys had. But all of these guys that I just quoted, they, they have all seen that there's a conscious mind and that there's a conscious intelligence. There's a reason and a purpose for all of, all of our existence. And they've, they've done that just purely by simply looking, looking at the physical nature of, of the way the universe is put together. It, it, ju it just can't have been put together without a guiding hand. And of course, uh, we, we, have, we have come to believe that that guiding hand is God. So uh, tr trying to get rid of this uh, aspect of, of determinism is, is extremely important. Uh, extremely important be because it, it has been the foundation of the paradigm, both in science and also conventional religion, that we really don't have uh, uh, control over, over this vacant space out here, this spiritual world. Uh, science has told us we don't have control over because it's all controlled by the molecules. It's the forces within the nuclear atom that controls everything. And we know now that's not true. And religion has been telling us that we don't have any control over this because religion said that uh, at the end of a certain time in history, all of, the, all of the miraculous things that are capable of being performed through the implementation of faith are no longer operational. And uh, as you know, <laughs> Our whole religious world is filled with that concept that, uh, that God no longer uh, creates uh, miracles. God no longer creates uh, uh, miraculous healing. And uh, God no longer gives us as humans the capability to be creators just like he is. And that's where I want to pick up uh, tonight to show you that, uh, that God has endowed us in every way, shape, or form with those very capabilities. And uh, just, uh, just a few weeks ago, I began to look at the most recent uh, uh, scientific evidence and Nobel Prize winners in, in talking about uh, DNA, the, the carrier, you know, the, the molecular carrier of all this information that we have uh, in, in us and in life. And again, this is just a schematic of the, of the actual molecule of DNA, but within this molecule, these, there is, there's held all kinds of information. And this information is held within the DNA molecule in the form of sound, and in the form of light, and in the form of electromagnetic waves. The very, the very things that God used to create the universe are contained within, within this DNA molecule. And uh, it's, it's most recently been discovered that within the DNA molecule, not only does the DNA molecule emit light, uh, in fact, there's a whole new field of science to study the light emitted from DNA. And my DNA emits a different light than your DNA. And that's one of the things that differentiates us. My DNA emits a different sound than your DNA. We have different sound frequencies. Uh, and those, those, we have instrumentation today to literally measure 
the fact that there's that great variability in humanity, and you can boil it right down to the, to the carrying molecule of this information. Well, how is, how is this information carried as, as, uh, uh, as a uh, product of our DNA? So, uh, you know, as we saw last time, when God injects information into water, uh, there's a, there are a lot of scientists today that uh, totally uh, think it's absurd to think that water carries information. I mean, this has been a, this has been a contention in, in medicine for, for years and years and years. I mean, the whole, the whole uh, field of, of homeopathic medicine is based on the fact that water carries information. I didn't, I didn't even know that. I mean, I've criticized homeopaths for most of my career and didn't even know what I was criticizing them for and come to find out they're right. <laughs> water carries information. And uh, I never knew that before. Nobody ever told me. <laughs> uh, so what I want to do here, uh, that's very, very important because it's the same medium that God used when he created the universe. So uh, you mean to tell me that we literally have evidence of that today? Well, let me tell you about what's happened in the last two years in molecular biology. It just about blew me out of my seat when I read this. Uh, there's a neuroscientist in Italy, one in uh, Cambridge, and one in uh, Tokyo, Japan, who uh, won the Nobel Prize in 2012 for, for the work in this area. And what they, came to, what they, what they did was that they, took, uh, they took water and they took a strand of DNA in, in this water. Now, the question is, is that DNA molecule that's all packed with information, you know, DNA is the carrier of life. They took human DNA and put it in water. And then they took the, they took the, the DNA out of the water. So now you've got water, and here's the, here's the DNA out here. Now, who would, who would think that that water has any information left in it from that DNA molecule? Well, I, for one, would have bet my last dollar that anybody that thought that that water contained information from that DNA molecule had taken leave absence of their mind. Because there's absolutely no way that I conceive of can that ever happen. But what they found was that when they took this water that had this DNA in it, and they, they added to that... The, the chemicals, the substrate, the chemicals, just the fragments of chemicals that make up DNA. There was no organization to it. These were just the root bare chemicals. You know, as we saw at the creation of the universe, God created humanity and life out of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. I mean, basically four, four chemicals is all, is all he used to create the majority of life. So here's this water now that has these fragments of DNA in there. Now the question is, is there any organizing force to that water? So what they, what they did was they, they uh, let, let that water sit with those fragments of DNA in there, and then they, they looked at what the, was the uh, outcome of that water containing information, and that water entirely replicated the exact same uh, structure, the exact same uh, base sequence as the original DNA did, which means that you can inject information into water, you can, re you can remove the physical source of that information, and the water is going to carry that information to be replicated. All you do is just add the substrate, just add the products that are necessary for it. Now, so what does that mean to a Christian? I mean, to a non-Christian, it may mean one thing, but to me what it means is that uh, God injecting uh, information about you and I as human beings. When he, when he created the universe and injected you and I into this information field, that information field went into this water. And then when he allowed that water to be exposed to carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen, guess what that water made out of it? It made you and me. It made our DNA. And that DNA is carried on to create us in a physical form. So that, that shows the tremendous information carrying and transmitting capacity uh, of water, that you can literally create, recreate the original DNA uh, without, without any outside instructions. All the instructions are coming from the, from the original DNA being carried by the water molecule. 
So I mean, that's, a, that's a phenomenal finding, and, and, and it uh, corresponds with what we were talking about last time uh, with regards to how God created us, injecting information and energy into uh, the water. So now the, the, next, the next step, I have, I have had uh, uh, great skepticism as a physician uh, praying for patients, uh, praying for myself. Um, as I've said in my own personal testimony, after sustaining a, a, a severe spine injury and, and having seven reconstructive spine operations, at one time being in bed in a body cast for nine months, another year being in bed in body cast for six months, and recovering through all these operations, you know, I began to wonder, I wonder what the, I wonder what the end limit is. <laughs> you know, I, wonder, I wonder if there's, a, there's an end to this capability of literally recovering and recouping. And, and I, to be honest with you, I, I really worried about that because I thought, man, I'm, I'm using up whatever I've got. I'm using it up like a gangbusters here. I don't know how many of these recoveries I have left in me. Um, but I, I've always wondered about uh, the recovery of, a, of, an injured, of an injured physical part of our body. I, I've also had, a, uh, as you know, a, a cardiac arrest. I had a, I had a large uh, anterior wall uh, heart attack. Now, that, that heart muscle has been replaced with uh, fibrous tissue. I can see it when they do a cardiac echo. I can see that. I can watch my heart beating, and there's an area of the heart that isn't beating normally. But as I said uh, last time, or the time before that, that, that since I've changed my belief, and since I've changed my way of thinking, my ejection fraction has gone up 10 to 15 percent, which is a dramatic increase. Doesn't sound like much, 10 to 15 percent, but it's the difference between uh, uh, misery and, the, and, and almost normal. And it's all on the basis of, of, what, of what I believed. I, be, I began to believe that there is a regenerative potential within mankind that we can literally implement. It's that, it's that power that was within. If we, if we stimulate that power within, it can literally regenerate. We can regenerate strokes. We can regenerate uh, heart disease. We can regenerate all, all of this stuff. Um, our son had acute lymphoblastic leukemia. I mean, his bone marrow got fried, and he was able to regenerate his bone marrow, and to a certain extent, regenerate a lot of other stuff uh, because he had so many medical complications to his illness. Well, how, did he, how was he able to do that? Uh, we, we were at his bedside praying, but I must admit, at that time, I, I hadn't come to the understanding and knowledge that I have now, and I was praying. Uh, but I was praying with my, again, my tongue in my cheek with, with an element of unbelief in my mind because I just didn't see any way possible. I mean, how do you, you have to understand that when, when the human body injure, is injured, and as I said day one in here, that we've all been injured in some way, whether it's an emotional injury or a car wreck or a spinal cord injury or a heart attack or a stroke or uh, abuse or abandonment, every single one of those insults to our human uh, body and soul is a physical injury. It is a literal physical injury. And I, and I explained that uh, uh, electron microscopic evidence of people's brains who undergo severe stress and severe trauma literally have holes in their brain. The, 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 the hormones of stress are destructive to the central nervous system. They, they cause uh, the, the pulling apart of synapses, the very uh, object of how nerve impulses are transmitted, one nerve impulse to another. But what happens when the body loses this ability to survive, these cells survive, all those cells get replaced with cells called fibroblasts. Fibroblasts are scar tissue. I mean, anybody who's cut their finger and just look at the, where the cut was, you'll see a little line there. Well, those are fibroblasts that come together and knit together and form that. And I have, I've had, I don't know how many people over my Christian uh, uh, experience in, in medicine uh, say, well, Dr. Bishop, is there any reason that, that I should be praying to, uh, to have my heart regenerate itself after a massive heart attack? And I would say, well, the, all things are possible with God. All things are possible with God, but did I really believe it? That's, that's where the rubber meets the road. Do you really believe that? Well, I have to admit, I, I uh, didn't really believe it. I, 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 I fell into disbelief. And disbelief is one of the things that stops the flow of faith out of our spirit organ. And it impedes healing, and not only for ourselves, but if you're trying to uh, uh, accentuate healing in another person by praying for them, it, it, al it also uh, uh, retards healing for the other person as well. So unbelief and disbelief uh, is, is a bad thing. It, it inhibits faith. It, it prevents faith from having its full power. 
and it's what we're out to try to get rid of. So take these fibroblasts and, and turn forward to the last two years. In this neuroscience lab, they have taken these uh, uh, adult, fully mature fibroblasts. Let me just uh, show you something here. Uh, you know, it, you, you all know that, uh, that uh, cells in the body start out, start out as, uh, as a stem cell. And that stem cell comes down and, and it has a division and, and that, that line of cells, which is called a pluripotent cell line, comes down and has a number of divisions. Well, you know, the further down the line you get, the less likely you have of actually ever having that cell become anything other than what, is, what it already has become. So here's a stem cell. Now this stem cell can turn into a bone cell, a hair cell, a skin cell, or any of those kinds of cells, depending on what its environment is. We know, now, we know that today, that that's not determined by the DNA in that stem cell. All stem cells have the same DNA in them, but some stem cells become hair cells, some stem cells become liver cells, some become kidney cells. Well, what causes that transformation? What causes it is the influences from the outside is what causes it. And that blows biologists' mind because biologists don't believe there's any information source from the outside. They believe it all comes from the DNA out. Well, we know that doesn't occur. So here you have these, these, uh, these cells in the human body. And down here at the bottom, you have a fibroblast, the one I'm talking about. This is the, this is the star cell. Now, fibroblasts are fully, fully determined cells. There's they're so many cell divisions away from the stem cell that this cell right here can no longer... Uh, provide any of the functions that a stem cell has. A fibroblast is a fibroblast is a fibroblast. Got it? <laughs> There's nothing you can do to change it. <laughs> we thought. <laughs> so here, here's this fibroblast. In, the, in this uh, molecular biology lab in, uh, in Italy, uh, what these researchers did was they took fibroblasts, fully mature human fibroblasts. They took those that out of uh, cells, uh, fibroblastic cells, out of... Uh, people that were developing scar tissue. And they subjected those fibroblasts to three different physical forces. Now these aren't Christians. They're not trying to either refute or substantiate the Bible. They're just doing, they're just doing science. But it just so happened was that they, they subjected these fibroblasts to sound and they subjected them to electromagnetic energy. And by a, uh, exposing these fibro, adult fibroblasts, fully differentiated fibroblasts, to a certain sound frequency and or a certain electromagnetic frequency which is consistent uh, with the, the, the electromagnetism that we all uh, generate by our own hearts and our own mind, they were able to reset the DNA in a fibroblast and turn it into a stem cell. And those stem cells then could be directed to form a heart cell, a nerve cell, like a re rehabbing a stroke patient, a spinal cord cell, uh, a liver cell, a kidney cell. Uh, that's, I mean, that's, this, is, this is just in the, in the last year that this, is, that this has been done. I mean, this literally blows the mind of, of a molecular biologist. I mean, it, it blows my mind. That means that if you're praying for somebody uh, and, and trying to exert this power from within that you have through, the, through your word, your spoken word, and through the electromagnetic energy that you're producing by your heart. And as I said last time, the brain and the heart are the two organs in the body that produce the electromagnetic energy. The heart produces 5,000 more, uh, uh, 5,000 times more magnetic energy and 100 times more electrical energy than the brain does. So it's our heart that is the main organ in this process that we use to interact with our environment. And th that, that showed that we can take uh, human fibroblasts and, and turn those fibroblasts, turn, turn these cells around by altering the, the, the regulatory mechanism of the DNA and cause those cells to literally uh, reform a person's injured heart, to reform a person's injured brain, to reform a person's injured liver, reform a person's spinal cord. Now, with all of this that I've said, with my tongue in my cheek, I, I noticed that, that uh, you know, my own college experience was that I went from 25% uh, in the bottom of my uh, high school class to, to an honor student, and the only mechanism that was able to do that was the fact that I was able to transform my brain. God literally, 
without even knowing it, had, had showed me that, that the, way, the way my brain works is that I have to hear something, I have to see it, I have to say it, and I have to write it. And as soon as I started studying like that, I started cranking out A's and B's like nobody's business. As I told you, I thought people thought I was cheating I was doing so well. Uh, nobody accused me of it, but <laughs> I often wonder in the back of my mind if they did. So I, I, knew, I knew that the human organism had a potential. And I would take stroke patients 40 years ago when I started practicing medicine. I, I would take stroke patients and I would say, a per, person lose the ability to use their right hand. And the next morning after that stroke, I would tell that person to start looking at their right hand and start telling their right hand, I am going to move. I am going to move. And purposely, at least three to four times a day for 20 minutes to a half an hour, I told that person to talk to their hand and to begin to try to move that hand and do it consistently. That's called focusing your attention. When you focus your attention, you can do great things. And that's why this thing is called Focus Faith Heals. Because if you focus your attention enough you, on, on a particular topic, uh, you literally change the molecular structure of your brain and you can begin to regrow neurons. Studies have shown that people who focus their attention, these are, these are patients who have severe uh, emotional, mental issues, uh, diseases, as well as strokes. They, there's a, there's a, uh, a chemical in the brain called uh, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. It's a protein that stimulates brain development. And you can take a stroke patient and, and, and measure, do a blood test and measure his uh, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, and, it, and it'll be, uh, that brain-derived neurotrophic factor is way down here, and if you start telling that person to focus their attention on rehabbing that, that part of their brain that's been injured, you can follow that brain-derived neurotrophic factor, and within a period of 24 to 48 hours, that, that hormone or uh, protein is literally uh, increasing in the bloodstream. It's measurable, and it's been measured countless numbers of times. So we know that that, that has a tremendous facility on allowing us to, uh, to rehabilitate ourselves. But, but now with this, uh, with this uh, new evidence that you can literally change a, an adult, already differentiated cell that's supposed to be uh, a determined cell, um, it's not so determined. We can literally turn the, turn the clock back on that cell by changing the structure of the DNA, changing the signaling and the messaging of that, and, and change it back to uh, a functioning uh, stem cell, and that can be directed to form a new heart cell or a new brain cell or a new spinal cord cell. Well, if you can do that to a fibroblast, then why can't you do that to a cancer cell? And of course, as I mentioned one of the other nights, um, they've taken uh, cancers out of patients, and they've taken the, the uh, literal lesion right out of their colon or breast cancer or wherever the cancer resides, and taken those cancer cells and put those cancer cells out of that human who has cancer and put them into an ideal environment where the, the metabolic activity is regulated, the temperature, the humidity, all of the molecular biological structures are, are idealized. They're in a, they're in a healthy environment, and those cancer cells can literally reset their DNA and they can become normally functioning cells. You don't come back a week later and find the petri dish filled with cancer cells. You find uh, some cancer cells there, but you find the predominance of cells, depending on the environment, have completely reverted into normal cells, which, which means that, that we have that potential within us. I mean, all, all of these factors uh, have been discovered and researched and developed, not, not by people who are trying to substantiate the Bible. I, that's me. <laughs> I'm trying to do that because I've been such a skeptic all of my life and, and in a state of, of unbelief that this just can't happen. This is just too good to be true. I mean, how, can that, how can that be? Well, er, er, almost everything I've ever said to that degree is <laughs> turning, turning out to be exactly uh, uh, what I had uh, rejected to begin with. So... Um, that, that bring, brings us up to uh, a point here, and I want to just pause here and, and ask if you have any, any questions on this kind of information. I really want, this, this is, and this is life-changing information that I, I, just, I just told you about. When, when, I, when I read these uh, studies a couple of weeks ago, I mean, I have reread, I have reread, I have <laughs> looked back at those uh, studies from uh, Italy and from uh, Cambridge and from uh, Tokyo, and, and these, uh, these molecular biologists and uh, uh, neuroscientists. I mean, they have really na nailed the fact 
that you can literally change the structure of, of mankind, change the structure of our literal DNA through a sound and through electromagnetic energy, both are forces of which we have control over in our lives. Yes, ma'am. Well, a, a way of getting into that is go to the Heart Math Institute in California's website. That's how I got onto this trail, and you just follow, follow the trail from you know, one, one, one site to another, but that's how I got onto it. Pardon? Oh, well, it's too soon. There, there's, uh, you know, the, the, the 2012 Nobel Prize was won by, the, by these two molecular biologists that took the water and had DNA in it and then recreated the DNA just from the information contained in the water. They, they won the Nobel Prize for that. Yes. Yeah, I've got, I've got some videos I'm going to show tonight that will answer that. But let me just tell you about my own experiment I did this summer because uh, I was in the process of looking at all of this stuff here. And I thought, well, I mean, I don't have a neuroscience lab or a molecular biology lab, but I can go to the, drug, uh, the uh, grocery store and buy some lima beans. <laughs> and this is all based on the parable uh, of the sower. All of the biochemistry, all of the embryology, all of the genetic stuff, all of this stuff is, is represented in the uh, uh, parable of the sower. So what I did was I, I, took, I, was, I was looking for, uh, I wanted to see with my own eyes a, a uh, bean seed begin to form a root structure. Because I, I have looked at neurons developing in human brains uh, for countless hours with the electron microscope and uh, look, heard the sound they make and look, looked at the light that they make and all of this stuff. So I just wanted to see it on my own. So I took lima beans and I was going to watch the root structure. Well, what I did was I took uh, the same water. It was, just, it was just the water that I bought at the grocery store. You know, distilled, it wasn't distilled. It was just bottled water. But it was the exact same source of water. And, and I took uh, one, one part of the water and I subjected it for 48 hours to listening to the Praise and Worship CD from Karis Bible College. I, I, my wife laughs about it. I, I, took ear, I took earphones, and I put the earphones on the bottle of water. So anybody walking through my garage looks over, what in the world are you, a bottle of water listening to music? <laughs> but but I, I, I wanted to know, does that change the molecular structure of the water? Does it do anything to the viability of that water? Because I had just come into the information and knowledge that there's a fourth phase of water, this biological phase of water, the water that God used when he created all of life. So uh, I, I did that, and then I just left the other water. I took it out of the house so it wasn't exposed to that sound in any way, shape, or form. Then I, then I took lima beans, and I dropped the lima beans in, in both receptacles of water. And the, when, when you uh, immerse a bean in water, like all... Uh, seeds, it becomes imbibed with the water. It takes water into itself, and then it splits the shell, and that activates the uh, carbohydrates, the, the fats, and the proteins in the molecular structure of the water, and then it goes in and, and uh, activates the DNA. DNA is no good unless it's, unless it's surrounded by water. D water is what gives DNA its double helical structure. Without water, DNA is, is, uh, is not functional. So I did that, and I wasn't even expecting I was just waiting for a root to form. And what I found was that 48 hours, uh, the, the, the water that had been exposed to the praise and worship music began to show bubbling and signs of fermentation and high degree of metabolic activity, a lot of turbidity in the water, and there was literal carbon dioxide bubbles coming out of it, meaning there was a process of fermentation due to carbohydrate metabolism. All this stuff was going on in my, in my spirit water, which is what I called it, my spirit water. And I looked, my other water, it, there was, the, bean, the bean had split open and everything, but there was no metabolic activity there to it. So I, I proved to my, and I did this over, over again. <laughs> I thought, well, maybe I made a mistake here. I can't trust myself just on one thing. So I did it over again. 
And every time I did it, I got the same results. Was it 48 hours uh, it, before uh, the spirit water, the water exposed to the praise and worship music, literally uh, had, had an effect? And we had, we had just studied in, in, at the Bible College about the, the importance of praise and worship. And looking back at the Israelites, they, before some of their, their, they encountered some of their enemies, just through praise and worship, they scared their enemies off. So why, how'd that happen? I mean, uh, who's afraid of a trombone or who's afraid of a, a flute or something? But, the, but that, has a, that has an effect on, on uh, what goes on in, in the universe. It certainly has an effect on biology. I can tell you that uh, just by my own observation. So if you're exposing yourself to praise and worship music, then you're going to get better quicker than somebody who isn't. And we found that to be true in, in our own family. When my son had leukemia, uh, my wife, uh, uh, against some of my own admonition, uh, refused to play anything but, but praise and worship music in our house. And I got so sick and tired of praise and worship music, uh, it wasn't even funny. Uh, but she uh, persisted, uh, wisely so, and uh, he, he survived a, a multitude of uh, difficulties. And I'm sure that had some part to play in it. Yes, go ahead. Oh, oh exactly, exactly, Glenn. Yeah, I mean, um, what, what, what you're asking is, well, how, how do we moderate the amount of energy, the amount of what force and what power do we emit from our heart? Well, how do, how do, you, how do you increase that, or how do you decrease it, or how do you keep it the same? Well, that, that's what we're going to get into. And that, that all has to do with how, uh, how much resonance we have with God, how, how much resonance we have with living our lives, our thoughts, our emotions, our feelings, and our beliefs. How, how resonant is that with God's Word? The closer that it resonates with God's Word, the more we're able to, to tap into that energy source. You're absolutely right. Faith, faith comes by hearing. I mean, he, hearing is, is cri critical. I did, I, of course, I had no idea that when I was <laughs> going through college and having to read to myself everything that I read. I, I, I just couldn't grasp it if I didn't read it to myself, if, if, if I didn't hear it. I had to hear it more than once. I had to hear it. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. She, she was, uh, she was uh, reiterating some of what we were talking about, the fact that, that God heals us through the, uh, through the implementation of what we're able to uh, generate in our heart in terms of our faith position, our faith status, and that's, that's a condition of our heart. Faith comes through the heart. Yes. Yeah, there's, there's been a lot, of, a lot of replicated studies with that that, that, that Emoto from Japan has done, uh, put, putting, putting uh, different uh, cultures of yeast, different bacterial cultures, uh, uh, in front of, of praise and worship music, in front of Metallica, and, and in front of just plain conversational language. And... Uh, the, 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 the uh, growth, the, not, only, not only bacterial and, and yeast growth, but plant growth and human cellular growth is significantly negatively influenced by the metallic music. Metabolic activity? Yeah, that, that's, that's the, the process of, of uh, the degradation of proteins, carbohydrates, and fats. That, that's uh, like if you eat a meal and you start digesting your food, that's metabolic activity. That's what, this, that's what was happening in this water. The water was, the way a plant gets its energy is by metabolizing carbohydrates, fats, and, and uh, uh, protein. And you can, you can determine the amount of metabolic activity by the amount of carbon dioxide being released and the turbidity of the water. Hmm? Sure. Yes, Glenn. Yeah. <laughs> That's, you know, some, some enterprising, uh, some enterprising uh, person uh, pick up on that and start uh, selling the water. But you know, when I, when I, after, I, after I read that, I, I went into the uh, literature, and there, there's countless numbers of examples of Christians all the way back into the 14, 1400s who have been exiled, put in prison. And there was one case in particular, there was a monk that was uh, back in the 1400s or 1500s was, was in a Roman prison and was given the most vile sewage water to drink. And, and the, the emperor that uh, literally put him in the stockade as uh, being taken care of thought, well, this guy will never last a month because there's no way he's going no to make it. There was another group of Christians that were shipwrecked. And they were, in, they were uh, out at sea for over a month without fresh water. 
And what they did was they spoke into their water with their prayers. And if you look at the studies on this exclusion zone water, it literally can be formed by the, the, the force of your, uh, and the content of what your sounds and what your words are. So praying over water, uh, you know, there's no, no, no point in going out and buying spirit water because you can make it yourself. Just talk nice to your water. <laughs> read, the, read your Bible to the water. <laughs> it's free. It's like everything else that God gave us. It's free. Ma'am? What's that? Oh, it's called the Heart Math Institute. H-E-A-R-T-M-A-T-H. Mm -hmm. Heart Math. Heart Math Institute. It's in uh, California. Yeah, if you just Google Heart Math Institute, you'll get onto their website, and, and then it'll lead you into it. Yeah. She was talking about prayer. It would seem to make common sense that, that we should be cognizant of praying over our water, being, being uh, cognizant of praying over our food uh, to, to increase the uh, uh, biological uh, metabolic activity for our health and well-being. Oh, yeah, no, it doesn't have to be. I mean, for, I have to have it myself because I'm a slow learner. But most other people probably don't have to have that additional sound, but I, I found I had, to have, I had to have it sounded out by my own voice. Well, when you, when you speak in tongues, I mean, you're directly speaking, speaking to God. You know, the neural I mean, I don't know if there's ever been, been an experiment that actually shows that. <laughs> yeah, it's a very good question. Yeah, yeah, good, good question. Since, it, since it's godly language, I would imagine it would have a positive effect, but I don't know. And again, you know, we're all given, a, every human being is given a measure of faith. As, as I said before, I, I mean, I've had people who have gotten better because they had faith in a CAT scan machine. And they wouldn't have gotten better unless they had a negative CAT scan, and that was enough to implement their faith that they got better. I mean, as soon as I told them they got, their CAT scan was negative, all their symptoms dissipated, just like that. They had faith in the CAT scan. You know, as a society, we put all of our faith in medicine. You know, we've made medicine an idol. Medicine, I don't think, did that. I think we've all done that. <laughs> we, we've made medicine an idol, so we think uh, drastic things when we don't get better by medicine today. Well, medicine was never purported to be a great uh, uh, cure-all for everybody. Uh, but we, so we're all given a measure of faith. That faith can be stimulated by a multitude of things. You can have faith in a flower, and that's going to have a beneficial effect in your body. But as my diagram shows over there, my model shows over there, that we're given, we're given the option to fortify our measure of faith by Jesus Christ, a personal relationship through salvation with Jesus Christ and, and through the implementation and action of the Holy Spirit. That energizes and potentiates our faith to the maximum degree. I just happen to think that a Christian uh, fortified with a personal relationship with Christ and fortified with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit working in their lives, if they're, if they're seeking and resonating with God, they're going to have a greater potential to heal themselves than someone who uh, believes uh, something else. Well, it's never hopeless. I mean, all things are possible through God. I've, I've never told a patient in 35 years that there was no hope. I've never told a patient in 35 years they were going to die, ever. So you just speak in the word they don't have well, when you're, when you're speaking to an individual, I, I, as I, I've given you some examples, uh, Kat, uh, I, I've walked into ICUs where a patient of mine with a head injury has been in a coma for three days. And uh, have the nurses say, you know, every time you walk into this room and talk to that patient, I mean, there's a change in heart rate, there's a change in blood pressure, there's a change in mobility, there's a change in sensorium. I've had people come out of a coma and sit up in, the, sit up in their bed. They've been surrounded by people all day long. And I walk in and start talking to the patient, and they sit up and say, oh, hi, Dr. Bishop, how are you today? What have you been doing today? You know, you know, they have to understand that we're spirit, soul, and body, which we're going to be we're working our way toward. But even if a person is, is so physically injured that it doesn't appear like they're cognizant of what's going on, speak to their spirit. Their spirit is, is, is in good shape. But yes, you can be in, we are intercessors for, for people who, who have uh, great uh, uh, difficulty receiving information. 
but they, they have an intact spirit. The spirit is of a different, you know, it's of the spiritual kingdom. It doesn't answer the laws of the physical universe. It supersedes all physical laws. So always look at an individual with deficits and deficiencies. I mean, look at every human being uh, as the fact that their, their, their true person is in their spirit. And the spirit guides their, what goes on in the soul and guides what goes on in the body. It emanates from in out. Yeah, thank you. Okay, maybe we'll just take a, about a 10-minute, 15-minute break uh, to get something to drink. and.